My name is Chris Schwann. I'm the executive, newer executive director of Niagara Regional Native Center. I've only been appointed here for about 10 months now. So, yeah, as executive director, there's a number of programs that we provide to community, to the indigenous, the urban indigenous community of uh, of this catchment area, Niagara on the Lake, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, Pelham, Fawn Hill, um, Beamsville. So we, we cover quite a bit of the Niagara region um, with specific socioeconomic or social service type of programs for the indigenous community of the Niagara region. Everything from cradle, well, actually for everything from womb to grave, really, ultimately. and any of those socioeconomic impacts that Indigenous people face is what should be dealt with um, as programming through friendship centers, in my opinion. You know, everything from, you know, your, your mother's first words is, is education. So you're, you're talking about even programming for mothers is really everything to do with education. Um, because how does that mother even sing to that child while the child is in the womb? That's education. Mm -hmm. um, so when that child is it comes to this physical world and and um, some of those teachings in life and lessons of life and how do we come to learn about um, creation and, and uh, the creator and um, our own connectedness to to Mother Earth comes initially from those initial teachings. So uh, in regards to the actual center yeah there's there's a lot that could be spoken about what the actual friendship center movement is and where it's been and where it's going to and what how does it include education currently the Niagara Regional Native Center is is involved with um, has an agreement with the Niagara District Catholic School Board and we have uh, an agreement where the Niagara District Catholic School Board administers or runs the an indigenous school called Soaring Eagles and that's from K to 8 programming. And um, it's, it's meant to be in, in a, a land-based programming initiative. It was more than anything a call to action under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission by the Catholic School Board to try to meet their potential obligations and their calls to action. Um, so currently, right now, we have this agreement with the Catholic School Board. Um, I would think that it could be a little stronger, personally. Um, uh, it was a program that I, that I, as a newer ED, I, uh, you know, as I moved into this position, it was something that had already been established. What I found through assessment and analysis and communication is is that it's not necessarily an indigenous school. Um, it's meant to have indigenous land-based programming. It is meant to provide a culturally safe environment. It is meant to provide cultural education, especially. You know, mm -hmm. um, when in fact I, I, you know, the 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 whole world the the. The realm of education for Anishinaabe and Eurocentric methodologies, um, however, I'd have to say is something that, you know, Indigenous people aren't necessarily experts on. We have our own form of education um, that we are experts on. And now that we're dealing with this Eurocentric institutional methodology, you know, we, we it's everything. It, even my experiences in the 70s, as a child, they knew, you know, I went, I went to a Conexus conference a couple weeks ago, and one of the speakers was talking about how they actually had a, a big stamp, and that stamp used to identify people as being retarded. And I had that stamp put upon me in the 70s, in, um, in, the, late, in the mid to late 70s, and I was actually put into a, a special ed school. Mm -hmm. Uh, why? Because I like to look out the window too much, you know, and then uh, so looking out the window too much, being a little distracted, daydreamy, flighty is what they determined me to be, highly distracted, you know, when in fact, you know, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to be outside ultimately, but, you know, when you're, when you're given that type of a title, 
And that's what I find is that we're, we're redefining all these new titles, yeah. uh, what is to be successful. Um, you know, because I guess what I'm looking at here right now, sorry, and I, I might bounce around a little that's bit, okay. but... Yeah. Uh, my experience as being on reserve in, in, a, in a city, urban, indigenous person is that, you know, uh, on the First Nation, you know, back in the day, we children were bused into town from the reserve, and then they had to go home. So they had to take the Indian bus into town and take the Indian bus home. Um, and now we have our own schools on the First Nation. So the conversations within my Anishinaabe network and some of my friends within the Haudenosaunee, um, within the Haudenosaunee Nation is, is this, that we have these schools now where once upon a time we had forced integration. Now we have self-segregating education. So I, I've been trying to determine what are those, what is a, a happy medium there? Because we had this forced integration where even our own children were, you know, forced to go into town, go to school. And then, you know, because they even had to ride on a different bus, they wouldn't, you know, uh, the non-Indigenous children wouldn't be caught riding on that bus with Indigenous children. So there was always a separate bus just to the reserve. So even that level of understanding and diversity doesn't occur. That sharing of culture, that sharing and sharing and sharing. There is no sharing. It's, it's, um, it, it seems like some of our, our educational institutes aren't, aren't very embracing of Indigenous people. Ultimately, it, it, is, it is ultimately about, in my opinion, helping this child learn to walk in two worlds. And that's really where I come to that understanding of my understanding of Indigenous children and education and soaring eagles, I guess. You know, I'm kind of circling around here, but... Um, that's kind of my understanding of where we are as education, and Indigenous people in this Eurocentric education. Right now, Soaring Eagles doesn't necessarily provide land-based programming. And what is land-based programming, and, and how do we define that? Um, ultimately, um, within my own cultural attachment business theory methodology that, that I've own created that's based on the seven teachings and what has happened to our seven teachings to where we are today, to where we need to go for tomorrow, um, you know, in those seven things. It's like a nice correlation. It's very simple. And even within my own research, how we found that education is one of those components of one of those segments that has been changed upon our people. And I guess what I'm getting at is, is that, uh, much like I was saying, this forced integration, but this Eurocentric methodology of, of education was also based on a, a, the Industrial Revolution. So where are we today? We're supposed to be trying to now educate children to jobs that don't even exist yet in society. That's really where we are. Like um, in today's technological world, we don't know 20 years from now what jobs are going to be available. Nobody can determine that. So how can you build, uh, how can any educational institution right now build these children to, of success? So it is a bit of a tricky thing. And then on top of that, our children are then also trying to learn and function and walk in two different worlds. We're all trying to maintain their, their identity as indigenous people and, um, and, and all the rights that they, that they have to their language and to their cultures. But again, that, that land-based programming, what I understand about our educational system is, you know, it's still Eurocentric right now for the Industrial Revolution, whereas our educational system and understanding of uh, education and success and everything else is where, how does that help the indigenous individual maintain their indigeneity? How does it encourage it? Um, you know, I, I, I see leaps and bounds by the local, by the local district school boards of making that, that call to action. The Niagara district or the uh, district school board of Niagara has made extreme leaps and bounds in meeting that call to action. Uh, you can see it with all the different activities and actions that they've done. They have their Facebook page, the things that they're doing. Even most recently, they had a drum-making uh, workshop for the Indigenous students of, of uh, DSBN. Like, those type of elements are 
That's what we need to see. Um, ultimately, the bottom line is, is that the elders have said to me, if the language was taken away from our children, then it needs to be restored within them. So ultimately, that is also the next thing that I believe in when it comes to our languages and education. Well, then our children should never, much like I was, I was forced to take uh, a language program that was not mine. I wanted my own language. And I was refused and denied continuously throughout my life any lessons of my own language. So, constitutionally, I don't know what that means. So, I'm looking forward to that change within my time. I have grandchildren now, so it will be nice to see some of that legislative change for my grandchildren. Um, lastly, I'd also have to say that, you know, there is a fine line of understanding this educational realm because I have a different perspective. Um, when I was a younger man, I would quite often say um, this, this way is the white man's education. And, you know, I was rather naive and ignorant about it, you know, uh, and made those comments. <clears throat> Whereas today, when I, when I work with young Indigenous um, people, and I'll, I'll specifically say I volunteer with young Indigenous, uh, young indigenous men, that I often say to them now, if you don't think that that's your education, then tell me of your indigenous education. Tell me of your Anishinaabe education. Tell me how well you can clean a fish. Show me how well you can clean that fish uh, and get all the meat off of it. You know, like I, I watch my cousins and cousins process and, you know, I'll help them process thousands of pounds of fish. And I, I'm not even a cutter. I'm just what we call the, 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 I take the bones out of the fillets and I take the skin off the fillets. So I'm just the boner and the skinner, whereas I'm not even the cutter. And um, because that's a very special skill set. And so I, I think of, I think of that, you know, show me how you take the cheeks off that fish. You know, what are you going to do with the bones? How much of that are you wasting? Um, show me how you make a stick bow. You know, like, let me show you, show me how to make a, what are you going to use for sinew for that bow string? What tree do you use to make the bow out of? What are you going to use for, for arrows, and arrow shafts? How are you going to put feathers on that arrow? You know, <clears throat> how many are you going to put feathers on that arrow? How are you going to nap and go find that flint and then nap that arrowhead as it is you know and then once you make your bow and your arrow you got to know how to hunt and you got to be able to bow hunt that deer that deer who is most elusive to humans for hunting it's it's all as much as humans have evolved to hunt deer deer have evolved to be elusive from humans their ears work independently they work like satellite dishes. Their eyes are also very independently. They can pretty much look behind their head while looking forward at the same time. They have more sensory glands in their bodies than, than what humans could ever fathom to have. But then on top of that, their speed, of course, their agility. Um, so the point is, is, is a bow hunter also has to be within anywhere from 30 to 35 yards to be 100% accurate. So education-wise, you know, what's, how do you smell that deer? How do you track that deer? How do, you, how do you age that deer just based on whether or not the size of its, foot, of its hoof print? Can you tell if it's male or female? Obviously, you can tell which direction it's going. You know, gauging its, its, its poop, <laughs> picking up its poop and determining how old is this poop? How long has it been since this deer has been passed here? Anishinaabe education. <clears throat> again, so this fish processing, this this deer processing, because again, this bow making, right, this arrow making, all the way to the hunt, and then processing that deer. So, what is that education? That education is very important, you know, and and how important is it that indigenous education is is everything? Because then, even as Tecumseh has said, you know, you, you know. We are very weak as one individual arrow, but as a bundle of arrows, we are, we are strong and we are mighty. So 
again, you know, it has many different ties. And, and I find that more and more of our indigenous ways are not being taught within schools. And we have to take extra time and 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 learnings uh, into our adulthood when we shouldn't have to to learn the lessons of what children are to be taught. And sometimes we have to go to our elders or to our spiritual people, like the Midewewanag, um, who help us with those spiritual journeys as well. Those are those ones who we go to for those teachings. And then we have our hunters and our fishers, and and we have those community members, those politicians, and. Our people have been doing this for thousands of years. It shouldn't be anything new, but it is new today. It's life. It's life. Everything, yeah, that would be my definition. I wish I could say that in the mind still. But what is Indigenous education? Indigenous education is, uh, is life. It's everything about life. Life is your education. Every day you're learning, you should be learning something. Out of every conversation, you should learn something. You're not there to, to talk to you. God gave us two ears and one mouth. So if the if Jim Nadeau gave us, you know, we're supposed to listen twice as much as we're supposed to talk. I, I mean, that's a, a common statement from around the world. But, you know, it was something that I I know, I believe that our elders spoke about too. You know, it's, it's really tough for Canada and their educators, and their regions, and everything to develop. How should we, what language should we provide in this school? I know growing up in the Niagara region, it was very tough for them to decide, because they don't know, you know, there is a large population of Haudenosaunee in, in, in the Niagara region, there's a large population of Anishinaabe, as well as, I've come to learn, Mi'kmaq, and especially a large population of the Métis Nation. In, uh, in the Niagara region. So I guess to more specific, you know, it's one thing if you can, you know, an educational model on reserve is, is different than it would be in an urban setting. So it would be totally different because the Anishinaabe Nation has moved ahead with its, with its initiative and in, in having our own Chinook Nagayans to have our own educational educational system. The Anishinaabe education system, right? So. In some senses, I like that because as Anishinaabe, we, we were people who wrote, Ojibwe. And um, so that only tells us that we've been good at being writing and we've had that consistency. Our seventh fire is always based on our prophecies and how we could write. And we wrote down our, our ceremonies, we wrote, we wrote, we wrote to ensure continuity. Other nations didn't, weren't a writing people. Um, but having said that, you know, be, you know, so when I think of when I think of that, I, I think of where we are as people, seven generations back and seven generations yet to come. Anyways, um, so <clears throat> when I when I think of those potentials of how education can be. You know, we 100% education could be a lot different than what it is on reserves right now because a lot of it is they're still doing those mandatory provincial programmings, provincial testings um, that don't apply to indigenous children. You get into this, you know, but at the same time, something needs to be something that helps so those who are coming off reserve and, and transition into the city what is going to be there? What is that life going to be like for them? Right? I, I, you know, I think of the different stories of those who, part of the early urban migration in the 60s, um, the urban migration that loosely started in the early 50s, but was hard in the late 60s, um, especially in Ontario. You know, like if, if that, you know, if people were to migrate again to the 60s and they didn't have that, you know, I, I, I know of many friends who don't have um, perhaps the interview skills, the communication skills to land a, a job that I would apply to. But if they apply to a job that they're fit for, such as working on cars or building a home, I know that they would show up to work ready for that.
Indigenous education really needs to, in my opinion, it needs to get a little firmer. It needs to understand that there is a growing element of entitlement and enablement within our society. There are many distracting devices of the world. You know, it's bad enough that our, in some of our families behind closed doors that mom and dad are highly distracted, let alone the little ones that, that they have been given by the Creator. So, in, in some senses, you know, I always say, you know, I found myself in a meeting not too long ago, in an education meeting, but and regarding a, one of our students at Soaring Eagles, and I was visiting with mom, mom, the mom was in the meeting, and I'm remembering back to a far side car, comic in the newspaper where it shows a picture of um, of um, two parents with their child sitting in front of them. It's a comic, and and the principal sitting at the desk, and they're they're showing a. a a note with an F on it, like for fail. And then you can see that the parents, oh sorry, the comic is different. The parents are standing with the, the principal, looking at the child, shaking the finger for giving the F, for getting an, a fail. And then beside that same comic, they show the difference of today. And the difference of today would be that it's the parent standing behind the child, holding the F, giving the parent, the principal, the naughty finger. It's not the school's fault, I guess is what I'm saying. And at the same time, when I also talk about these socioeconomic issues, as well as our determinants of health, um, the keys to whatever level of success, you know, like, how do we define that? And, you know, Indigenous education, you know, if we're going to be ones and partners, you know, regardless, you know, we're here, Canada's here, Canada's ex ex is established within our territory. And we, we, it's only beneficial to us that we learn to maintain those skill sets of our families, cleaning fish and hunting, and ceremony, like within the dynamics of my family, I'm very fortunate that even my ceremonial leaders, those Midawewanog that are in my family, they're still professionals. You know, they're still educated professionals. Um, now, that didn't come without a lot of scrapes, bumps, and bruises. And in some essence, that's what comes with making it through this system, that it wasn't easy. Being that two-world walker, you, you have to, you're going to come out of it with thicker skin. You're going to come out of it bumped and bruised because you're going to have to be faced with racism and discrimination if you're going to be part of a mainstream educational system. That's what that comes with. A child needs to be gifted some of the lessons of life, of perseverance and dedication and commitment and resilience. You know, to have that strength, you know, they have to have somebody walk beside them. Because as Anishinaabe, you know, that that looking in all directions, we, we're very mindful. And I think in some aspects that we've kind of forgotten some of those elements you know it's a it is it's a society of convenience today you know it's it's whether or not it's convenient for me to go somewhere is it convenient for me to do this is it convenient for me to do that to be here to be a part of this to be a part of that if it's not convenient then it's not convenient we even still, due to our intergenerational issues, through Canada's assimilation policies and practices, we've also become the leaders of developing new excuses as well as those distorted cognitions. And when I mentioned that before, what I'm referring to is that um, some of our people have redefined dysfunctional behavior and what is okay 
is that's okay you know um weekend binging that's okay no it's not you know um as your children get early that or as your when your children are younger that it's that you don't do certain activities around them whether it be partaking in alcoholic beverages or not as they get older you start to drink in front of them when did that become okay so i'm just and and i'm not that's not a judgmental situation because i'm just making a statement about that as an example like you know i see in some families where you know the the mom and dad won't touch anything they won't even have a little sip of beer in a glass until you know the children are in bed so nobody sees anything of what mom and dad are doing as the children get older so maybe they're 6 years old now and they're a little more self sufficient right these children that they can you don't know, have to help them with everything that mom and dad start to say okay i can relax a little earlier in my evening and in my experiences do i see where mom and dad would even break out as children get a little older and so when the child gets 12 years and older then how does that dynamic change again and then it changes again as they get as the child gets older through my own experiences which i won't really dive into but i've i've seen and maybe in a different context or a different atmosphere or environment might i share some very unique stories of my family on the reserves what it was like cuz <laughs> like i said my families are two my mom and dad are two ends of the spectrum mm-hmm. right so i know exactly every dynamic of our people's communities good bad and indifferent whether it be christian or not christian christian or ceremonial christian or like um very well um spiritual and don't do bad things to my father being the main bootlegger on in his community you know what is so the differences of life what i've seen for our people are highly dynamic and then what has that been for me growing up in poverty growing up in low income areas and high violence and things like that and seeing other indigenous families in that same environment and why is that you know so the the relationship between education and poverty is very high and i don't know how do we you know if that's the case you know there's also that level of financial literacy you know we that that indigenous people you know these this this concept of frog skins and and um how they apply today and how do we use them and how where do we use them how do we spend them and there's eligibility criteria and again this is us without that self determination because we have to abide by Canada's rules i am shkabewis anishnabish kabewis anishnabi okichitaba matisavish kabewis meaning that i am uh, i try to well one i try to use lies my language when and where i can yeah. um it might not be right <laughs> but i try um but you know i try to to live by that life um and being a helper that skabeo is you know i'm a helper i knowledge keepers is a new term and it doesn't apply to the nishnabi nation because it's either your skabeo is or i don't know knowledge keeper isn't you know and then i've seen how knowledge keeper has been well it's been elder backslash knowledge keeper i don't know how that works because our elders there isn't really i don't i don't even know if there's a word for our elders i can't remember if there is other than like old people but like um but even those who are appointed as elders by community don't call themselves elders so i don't understand again like you know whereas i've had other other older people from other nations come up to me and say look at my name tag it even says elder underneath it i was like Wow, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and I'm like, 
especially because of the family I come from, perhaps, the communities I come from, the nation I come from. I'm not, and I don't know what this gentleman's nation was. I know he was from west somewhere <coughs> in the States, <coughs> as well as from the States the other way, too. The point is, is that I've, I'm coming to learn what this knowledge keeper title is. But when I, I look at this, because this is also, some of these questions are talking about the revitalization of this, the revitalization of that. And why are we developing new terms? Why are we creating new terms to something that already exists? That sounds very Eurocentric, very Canadian to me. Um, to those who created those terms should look to their own language, to utilize their own language first. Um, Every time we, I, now that I'm here, I, I, when I hear of the leaders that I try to empower and stoke their internal fire of motivation and self-inspiration. So these new programs, I'm always saying that when we develop these new programs, that it should be in our language. And because we're in a multi and a diverse region, then we give it the languages that are predominant to the region and that only encourages people to utilize their language. The cultural connection and attachment theory, boom, right there. Mm -hmm. There always has to be a cultural attachment theory to everything. And even working with some of our leaders today, when I mention those terms, they don't understand what a cultural attachment theory is. When I mention that I've developed my own cultural attachment theory and methodology based on their seven teachings, yeah. there is that people can't understand that. So it is, you know, so getting back to where I was going about, you know, um, the seventh fire teach has taught me and my family and my elders have taught me that, you know, there is going to come a time when our people are going to lose their ways and then they're, you know, very short form. There's going to come a, a, a time where there's going to be these new people and we have to be mindful of them because they won't have all their teachings. And it's been up, you know, one of the things that I've been taught is that I may have to go to more than one elder to, to gather a full teaching. Because if our elders have gotten partial teachings, then I, I have to go, as that seventh fire generation, I have to go to many different elders to ensure that I get one solid teaching. I can't just ask one elder. What I appreciate about Anishinaabe elders, too, is that they really make you think, to use your brain, Right? Um, they don't give you the answers to a question. They give you things to contemplate for you to make your own decision based on your life experiences and or education. You know, it's never something like, uh, hey, how do I do this? Well, how do you think you need to do it? <laughs> you know, it's, or what do you think would be the best way? You know, it's always about more thought, more thought highly more analytical thought. And I find that that's only become a strength for, for many, uh, many a people. Um, <clears throat> you know, a knowledge holder, a knowledge keeper, having said that, they do hold a position with other nations. And it's a respectful position. But again, I, I still say, you, the, the, those nations that are developed this term, now I've been told, you know, and I'm, I don't mean to be talking around it, but I've been told that the Haudenosaunee use this term. Um, and the Anishinaabe are starting to utilize it as well. I've only come to learn this past week um, that I've seen somebody actually write it that was a Anishinaabe, a blended family, but the, the person carries a Anishinaabe name. So, but at the same time, I've come to understand exactly the importance of this position. But to put them as a backslash elder, you know, that's, that's a little concerning to me. That's a little concerning to me because, again, that's, that's this English. And you're trying to equivalent it to indigenous people. I, I don't, that transliteration is, is, is inaccurate. Anytime you transliterate anything, it's going to lose accuracy. It's going to lose sustenance, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so that's what I'd have to say about that.
Uh, you know, I raised my children, my grandchildren, with our teachings and storytelling. You know, like I find that there are there are resources to raise our children with those teachings, with like Nana Bush, Nana Bojo, right? But at the same time, this is a very peculiar teaching I'll, I'll provide that okay. was something that was given to me that um, where I'm from. You know, some would say it a couple of different ways. Kikonan, Nimki Benisi Kikonan, Wiwikdan, Nimki Benisi Minwa Wiwikdan, Nimki or Kikonan, Nimki Benisi Kikonan, Minwa Ashodanan, Wiwikdan, Minwa Ashodanan. It's Kettle and Stony Point First Nation in English. And um, we, uh, are the keepers of the Thunderbird eggs. And um, I guess this is a, a nice little educational thing. Like This is a kettle. Okay. This is a kettle, a Thunderbird egg. A small one. Those grow. They grow in the water. Um, we, you know, I've been known to take little ones out in the water and show them where the little, where the, the, the kettles start to grow and then they move and then they grow as bigger than cars mm -hmm. in the water. They bust out of the shale and everything else. Now in English, they would say that, you know, this is due to the water, you know, scientists of academia would say, you know, due to the rising levels, the rising and lowering levels of the water and the sedimentations in the water, this is how these, these concretions appear to grow. Fair enough. So I had this conversation with a, a scientist once, and I said, okay. In our language, we say, get you Manitou. And what I've been taught by that term is, is that it, it doesn't just mean great spirit, right? Our language is a little diverse. It holds spirit. It's alive. Um, and this comes from um, my aunt, who is a language speaker. And... Um, She would, you know, she would, she, she taught me that our, our language is alive, it's spiritual, and um, it's not cold, you know, like, like almost, you know, I don't mean to make it sound like English is cold, but it, it can be almost clinical in a sense, I guess, in that sense, right? It can be very too precise and very cold, but so anyways, get you mad too, <sighs> means, yeah, it means great spirit. It also means great mystery, great wonder, great I don't know why. Phenomena, it means holy smokes, what's that? It means a lot of different things. It just doesn't mean just that one particular thing. So when I was talking with this scientist and he told me his explanation as to why these concretions grow, I said, oh, okay. He said, so trees, they provide oxygen, yeah. Photosynthesis, right? Oh, it's a big word. That's education right there. Grade 10 science, photosynthesis. Or is that grade 9? I can't remember. Either way, point is, that was a number of years ago. And, um, but it's photosynthesis, you know, the, that greenery in the leaves, the intaking of carbon monoxide and dioxide, monoxide, yeah. <laughs> turning it into oxygen and emitting that oxygen, right? Now, so, this scientist, sorry, I'm going off here for a minute. End of the day. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, the scientist says, uh, I said, so, the fact, you know, these, these rocks, they grow. These are growing rocks. Sedimentations. Gotcha. Well, the fact that it only happens in one place of the world kind of neat. It's kind of neat. It's kind of just a neato thing. Yeah, it's kind of a neat thing. I think he realized where I was going with this by that point in time. I go, so it only happens here in Kettle Point. And, um, you know, they literally do kind of bust out of the ground, which has nothing to do with the sedimentations of the water going up and down. Um, that happens way out in the water, as well as it happens in to close to shore. 
the big ones are way out in the water and the little ones are close to shore. Mm. And there's big ones in, in close to shore too. They're inside the shale, busting out of the shale. And then when the water is out in the lake, and that, and my, my one cousin has taught me um, that it goes in within sessions, within years, every seven to ten years, the water goes out, comes back in. So you can, sometimes when the water's out, you can walk out and you can see where these giant kettles are busting out of the shale. Long point is, as I said to this scientist, I go, wouldn't you think that that is rather remarkable? He said, yeah, that is kind of remarkable. That only happens here. It only happens one place in the world, and it's rather unique. Perfect. So that's a bit of a phenomenon, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Then it's a great mystery. It's a Gitche Manitou. But understanding those components, even knowing that to have that comfortability as well, to have that conversation with somebody, that confidence of, the different things that I've even learned through life, you know, and that came through just experiences and life in general. That had nothing to do with academia. That was indigenous education that I went to him with. Indigenous education, you know, it's kind of like the, the thing now that it's become a fad to do land acknowledgements. But the true spirit of land acknowledgements is understanding that this land is alive. And we need to acknowledge it. That's the true spirit of an land acknowledgement. You know, what, is, what about it has been alive and how have we as indigenous people in the different areas of where we're going to do this land acknowledgement or say this land acknowledgement, how are we truly capturing the spirit of Mother Earth in that specific section? That's indigenous education. Understanding, you know, this, I guess, I don't know how else to say this, this Nimki Zibi Jawanam, this thundering river of the south. You know, when you think of where it starts in Lake Ontario, it's nice and soft and calm, and then it works its way towards Niagara River, then it plunges over, it picks up speed, and then it plunges over the cliff, and it goes and it, cre it has cut itself into the ground by creating that gorge, and then as it flows down, it's got all kinds of rapids and reoxygenates itself and then flows back, and it comes to another calm level, and flows back out into Lake Ontario. Let alone do we say that this is, this is the veins, the blood of Mother Earth, but yet that is how she also reoxygenates herself too, and reoxygenates her blood. So, and at the same time, you know, our, our people wouldn't, you know, if they're knowing that are you kidding me that they didn't know that that was there? They would have been wondering, you know, if they were thousands of miles away, they would have been able to see that, all that smoke, all this mist going up in the air. They would have said, what's going on over there? And then they would have walked over here. This isn't a new place for our people. I forget how to say the name in Anishinaab and what I really do. I, I was trying to think about it the other day. But um, it has its own name in all languages for its place. It was a sacred area. We looked at these places as sacred places of prayer. There are a phenomena. There are Gitche Manitou, right? So they were, again, that's that same thing. So our teachings and everything are, you know, knowing that first man, Wayne Bajo, was through here. Wayne Bajo came by here, visited here. And, you know, um, yeah, knowing that these stories, and, and when I think of some of these other questions and stories of children and grandchildren, and what have I told, and understanding even the stories of how, why do geese fly in a flock? You know, it's because Nana Bush tied all their feet together. Even that, right? Because, and that's a short, <laughs> that's very short, because... Really, he went and tried, he got, it was, it's a teaching of greed though too, right? He, he went in and tried to, he got one of them and pulled them underwater and he took the one back to shore and he ate it and he was, wanted some more. So he went and swam under and grabbed some more geese and 
and went back to shore and ate them. He really liked that. So he went back again the next day. He thought he'd grab a whole bunch and he thought he'd be smart about it and tie their feet together. Once they realized that what he was going to do is that the geese started, so, oh my God, we're struggling. He's pulling us all under the water. He's going to take us all and eat us all. And we need to work together. And then they literally started to fly up together and even lifted Nanabush into the air. And then that even comes, I've even used that teaching in a modern context today. Of how do you utilize that teaching in terms of a corporate teamwork environment? I've turned that teaching into a, a corporate teaching on teamwork. Where, what does it mean when, you know, you fly together? What is honking about? You know, why do geese honk? And it's about encouraging each other. Um, that when one geese goes down, another one goes down with it because it is sick or it is injured or something is wrong with it. Like one goose does not go down by itself. Usually two will go down with it. So that way it's not by itself. And then if something were to happen to that goose, like if it were to perish, then the other two would just take off and join another flock or catch up to its own flock. Here in our NC, um, I would like to see an indigenous school. That's what I'd like to see within the next 10 years. An indigenous school that provides um, land-based programming, meaning that literally that the children learn how to make these bows, that they learn how to fish um, and clean a fish, um, that they also learn how to make a madodo swan, right? a sweat lodge. Um, that they learn their language, that they learn their spirituality, because they're one of the same. If you learn your language and you're learning, you're supposed to be able to learn your spirituality. I know that might be a little counterproductive for those uh, indigenous people that are, that prescribe to a different religion. Um, but in essence, what they have yet to learn is that where, you know, that spiritual journey is, <laughs> we all go to the same place, period. <laughs> that's the way I look at it. It's, it's something that's very dear to my heart. You know, I've got, you know, because especially once you become a parent and then you become a grandparent, then you really start to look at that different perspective of life. So I do look at it now differently than I even did as a father. As a Mishomis, I look at it even totally different now in terms of what is education going to look like for my grandchildren, my grandchildren's grandchildren. I might even be able to see some of them. Who knows? So, or my grandchildren's children. I would like to see the day when, when our... People are walking and speaking their language fluently. You know, almost like how the French will speak French in front of you and not disclose what they're speaking about. <laughs> Our people have always done that though. And it's not to be decisive, but to have that to have that level of pride though to that's more what I'm talking about. Sometimes my bitterness of what has happened to my family is comes out. And I need to remember to demogna you know, I, I need to let that go. When I see that can that indigenous people are, are meeting are are at the same level with, of stratification within Canadian society and that we have a level of privilege that we can give to our children that a lot of people across the lake can provide to their children. That in 10 years, that we also develop a strategy that in, that's inclusive for not just the children, but for the struggling adults, the moms and dads that are still dealing with the trauma today, that maybe tomorrow they reach back for their education. 
statistically, I, I, my part of my own research was is that sometimes these young families, these young moms and dads, they'll start their families early. They'll leave school. And once they're done building their family, they'll then return to school to finish off their, their, um, their grade 12 or reach back for their grade 12. So sometimes it could be even in, uh, I think part of my research showed that uh, one mom reached back when she was 27. One mom reached back when she was 30s, up to even 43. You know, and now we're starting to see a new program developed under the Friendship Centers called uh, Homeward Bound, which is actually uh, working with victimized women and their children. Um, whether they're not, and and vic well, it's mostly homelessness initiative as well. So homeless homeless mothers with their children that may be dealing with even justice issues. Um, so it's literally taking that mother and their children in finding them where they are, helping them reestablish themselves. And that could be housing first, education, um, getting, it's all about getting them back on their feet and empowering them so that they can get themselves into their own home. You know, I know, I won't speak about the Anishinaabe clan from yesteryear, you know, because the, the challenges that Anishinaabe clan face today are a lot different than they were yesteryear. You know, um, but having said that, um, yeah, education, I'd, I would ha definitely have to see where, you know, I like to see more language apps, you know, for people to have their language available and learn. Again, it's the fluency, our ceremonies. You know, everybody should be able to access their ceremonies no matter where they are, whether it be in the Niagara region here or it be, uh, sheesh, I don't know, Can Am and Windsor. You know, everybody should be able to, in an urban setting, even downtown Toronto, should be able to access their traditional teachings and ceremonies right there. Um, because if, if if we've established ourselves over the last, like I've heard that there are five generations deep in the cities now. So if we're that deep in into the cities, then why aren't we providing that as as a means for our people? That's what I have to say about that. And, and when it comes to our education, that we are in control of our education, that we have more and more educators that are of health, you know, that, that, that they've dealt with their, their intergenerational, transgenerational trauma, that they've dealt with everything, that they've moved on, the magna adult, that they've let that go. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's so many different levels of achievement or definitions of success that uh, Indigenous people have yet to define. Do I think that it's necessarily through a Eurocentric educational uh, means? No, I don't. Never have I. I feel that Indigenous people have their ability to say that we don't necessarily need it always, but if you do want to go into a specific profession or area, then you are going to need this academic requirement. If you're going to become this or become that, like a carpenter, electrician, a teacher, or lawyer. There are certain aspects and capacities and criteria. There's certain um, verbiage and language, you know, so much that needs to be learned with those professions that, you know, it, it's, it's not just saying, you know, yeah, you can be a fisherman. You don't need a grade 12 to be a fisherman kind of thing, you know, or a hunter. My only problem with that is, is that I do know of a hunter. That if he is suffering here, she is suffering from addictions or whatever. That we, we need to gauge. There's got to be something, a give and take there too, because... As much as we can promote our community members to say, yeah, you don't need a grade 12 to be a community member, 
you know, because you have to be part of community. Um, that's that indigenous way. You know, to be part of community, you got to help with community. You know, and we'll get back there as as indigenous people. Our communities will get stronger and stronger. I already know this, but we need to move away from those dysfunctional behaviors, those distractions of life. Because I know of this one hunter. He he's feeding his addiction, and and he. He rolled over over a hundred deer one year and didn't provide one piece of meat to the elders of his community. That is where I say that, again, you know, as much as I say that education is good and good for Anishinaabes in that sense, for those professional jobs that they want to go that way, well, if you're also not going to do that, then you need to help the elders, is kind of what I'm saying. You know, if you're going to subscribe to that Anishinaabe Ogichi Tabama Tisuin, your first priority is to feed, protect, and provide for the weak and the meek and those who cannot defend themselves or, or take care of themselves. There are many old people in our communities who don't have hunters and fishers or healthy men or women in their families to help take care of them. So that's what I'm referring to. So we, we need that to... If you're not going to go this way and you're going to live this, this other old Anishinaabe way with those beautiful traits of the world, embracing all the resources, the Creator, God, Creator, God, Allah, however you want to refer, has given us. You know, it's the ceiling of our church is the sky. We can't even say that the sky is a limit because that's putting a limit on something, you know. All I have to say is that within the Creator's infinite powers and wisdom, do we really think that we're only limited to one way of thinking, one way of being, one way of this or one way of that? The medicine wheel teaches us that these four sacred ways of walking and living, praying and believing are all equal. They're supposed to be equal. Not one is better than the other. It's all equal pieces of the pie. And one, you know, it isn't three colors. It isn't one color. It is four colors. It's four directions. It is four seasons. It is four medicines. It's four, four, four. Many different things. So, um, yeah, there is lots, uh, I would say, that needs to, you know, I know that those old ones would even be, need to be consulted about that. What do they see? The elders always need to be asked these same questions. You know, that's what I'd also have to say about all of this. That it's one thing to ask community members, community people that are in different positions, but our teachings even tell us that that doesn't necessarily mean that that person knows their people, that that person knows their ways, that that person knows their teachings. I don't know all my teachings. I'm still learning. I'll always be learning. But I don't profess to say that I know them all. Um, I'm still an infant, I guess, in some senses, when it comes to our teachings and our language. And, but I think I'm maybe not so much an infant. Maybe I'm, a, I'm an adolescent or a teenager in some respects. So there, we all come at it in, differently.